Hello, everyone. I'm Thomas Simpson, Director of Public Affairs and Advocacy for the CNIB Foundation. Uh, people are slowly trickling in, so we'll give it maybe 30 seconds and then we'll get started. All right, and good morning again. My name is Thomas Simpson, Director of Public Affairs and Advocacy for the CNIB. And welcome to Connecting the Dots Session 502 and the announcement with CNIB, Moneris, and the Government of Canada. This session is the exciting launch of a new project that will help make the shopping experience of Canadians who are blind and partially sighted more accessible. A very special welcome for all those who are joining today. Joining us today are three very exciting panelists. We have John Rafferty, President and CEO of CNIB, Angela Brown, President and CEO of Monera Solutions, and the Honorable Carla Qualtro, Minister of Employment, Workforce Development, and Disability Inclusion. Each panelist will start with an opening statement, and then we will launch into a fireside chat. After our discussion, we'll open up to questions from any media on the line, as well as uh, connecting the dots participants. This session will end at 11.30 a.m. A reminder to our panelists to introduce yourselves before you begin speaking. Let's turn it over to John Rafferty for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Thomas. This is uh, John Rafferty. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with everyone uh, at the Connecting the Dots conference today. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Angela Brown and uh, the Honor Honorable Minister Paltrow. Uh, today is World Sight Day. Uh, it's a day once a year uh, where events take place around the world. Uh, and I think uh, it is very fitting that it is uh, on World Sight Day that we're here to make an announcement uh, of a partnership between CNIB and Moneris, uh, funded by the Government of Canada, that is going to fundamentally change uh, the experience for blind and partially sighted Canadians uh, when it comes to day-to-day -day shopping. Uh, every day, Canadians from coast to coast uh, uh, spend uh, millions of transactions that take place digitally. Uh, since the, uh, the, the beginning of COVID, uh, the transition away from, um, from paper money, which was already happening, has further accelerated. Um, and this has created a significant barrier for Canadians who are blind or partially sighted. Uh, over 1.5 million Canadians are dealing with interfaces, uh, point of sale devices, uh, that are creating uh, inaccessible experiences. We hear about this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. No one is has intentionally been creating additional barriers, but the move towards touchless environments, the move away from keypads, um, has created a, a process that is, uh, is becoming very challenging. Uh, whether it's Rocky in Toronto, who has to rely on his wife for sighted assistance to make a purchase, or Ethel in Montreal, who dreams of a day when he can go shopping by himself without relying on others. In fact, just today, I heard from someone in London, Ontario this morning, uh, who was unable to complete a tra transaction with a taxi company uh, because of the in inaccessible device. So that's from CNIB's perspective and on behalf of the one and a half million Canadians who are blind or partially sighted, why I'm so thrilled that the Government of Canada and Moneris and CNIB are going to do for point of sale devices what more than 20 years ago we were able to participate in as it related to accessibility of banking machines. Um, so again, thanks to everyone for participating today. I look forward to questions later and I will pass it back to, uh, to Thomas. Thank you so much, John, for your opening comments. Uh, we will now move on to Angela Brown from Moneris for her opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. Sorry for that delay. It is Angela Brown from Moneris. And uh, we are so proud to be a part of today's conference and this announcement. Our mission in Canada as Canada's largest payments processor is to expand acceptance and expand accessibility to as many Canadians as possible. And so this collaboration with the CNIB is allowing us to take our capabilities to the next level and ensure that all Canadians blind and partially sighted Canadians are able to conduct their transactions safely and securely and as seamlessly as possible. This is exactly what we intend to do every single day. And because we drive 
our own technology. We own and operate the software. We, we don't own and operate all the hardware, but we are able to drive that dialogue and that capability inside of the terminals that we deploy. And this has been a long time in coming, this work, and uh, the team is ready to go and excited uh, about the opportunity to turn this into a ubiquitous solution that will ultimately be rolled out across the country. So thank you to the CNIB for their guidance and support. Thank you to the Government of Canada for also making this possible. We will bring all of our capabilities and commitment to this project, and we're really happy to be a part of it today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. That was fantastic. And we're really excited to be working together as partners on this. And finally, but certainly uh, last, but certainly not least, we have Minister Qualtro who will be uh, presenting her opening remarks. Minister Qualtro. Thanks, Thomas. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carla Qualtro, Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Disability Inclusion, and a proud client and champion of the CNIB. It's such a pleasure to join you all on World Sight Day to help celebrate an important project that will help many Canadians with sight loss, including myself. I'd like to thank CNIB Foundation and Marana Solutions for helping, hosting us and for including me in your Connecting the Dot virtual conference. Now, as was said, COVID-19 has really changed the way we live our day-to-day -day lives. For people with disabilities, things have gotten more expensive, local community programs are not being offered, and services that have been provided by volunteers now need to be paid for. Adding to this is the switch, as John said, to cashless transactions, a practice which the Bank of Canada has cautioned against, leaving many Canadians with sight loss unable to make payments independently. Accessible payment terminals is something I've advocated for for years. I know firsthand how frustrating and vulnerable it feels to not be able to see your transactions, to have to ask someone to read the terminal for you, not knowing what button to press because all the terminals are configured differently, and having to sometimes surrender my PIN just to make it easier. Having people react to you with annoyance because you're holding up the line. I personally sighed with relief when my daughter at age five began helping me with my Interact transactions because at least I wasn't giving my PIN to a stranger just to a very blabbery five-year-old who was probably giving it to the entire world. An accessible payment terminal would be a game changer for the independence and financial security for people with disabilities, including in particular blind and partially sighted Canadians. And as consumers, I'm confident that those of us who benefit from these terminals would choose businesses who had them and pass by those who did not. The people who shop with us would also follow suit. This would give these businesses quite a competitive edge. Through the Accessible Technology Program, the Government of Canada invests in innovative projects led by the private sector, not-for-profit organizations and research institutes to develop new assistive and adaptive digital devices and technologies in order to make it easier for Canadians with disabilities to more fully participate in the digital economy. As a funding partner in this project, we're helping overcome technological barriers and promoting the financial independence and security of many Canadians. We're also investing in equal access and inclusion. We are literally investing in the full economic participation of our citizens. I've said many times over the past month that this pandemic risks exacerbating barriers to inclusion and perpetuating discrimination unless we take bold action. On September 23rd, our government laid out our priorities in the speech from the throne. We committed to take bold action on health, the economy, equality, and inclusion. This includes the first ever National Disability Inclusion Plan. We're dedicated to building on the important work we've done over the past five years and building on announcements like this one today. Thanks again for having me and I look forward to the discussion ahead. is Thomas. Thank you so much, Minister Qualtro, and thank you for your passion and advocacy over the years on this uh, amazing, um, amazing file and this barrier that really does affect almost all the 1.5 million Canadians with sight loss. We'll move now to our fireside chat with our panelists. I'll ask our panelists to turn on their video, please. I have prepared a few questions about today's announcement. Each question will be asked to all three panelists unless otherwise stated. 
A reminder again for each panelist to please introduce yourself when answering. The first question is this. What do you think will be the impact of making Monera's ter core terminals more accessible for people with disabilities? Let's start with Angela, and then perhaps Mr. Qualtro, and then followed by John. Thank you, Thomas. It's uh, Angela again from Moneris. Uh, you know, in a digital world, which we're all facing, cash becomes less and less of a relevant way to pay. And the, ter the technology has been there for a while with terminals, and yet a lot of the a capability to make it accessible to partially sighted or blind Canadians depended upon the, the keyboard, the tactile, uh, the, the raised bump on the letter on the uh, key five. And uh, that has a limited capability in a digital world. And so we've had to rethink the way that we present the dialogue for payments and make sure that it is, if it's an on-screen experience, that it can also be useful and accessible to partially sighted and blind Canadians. And so what we've done is work with uh, 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 the CNIB to do that. And I think the only way to solve this for Canadians is to do it in partnership in this way. It is going to allow secure transactions. It's going to allow the dignity and the financial independence for all Canadians to conduct their transactions safely. Uh, and it's going to also allow all businesses to also engage with their customers and give their customers the options and the security they need. So it's a win across Canadians across Canadian business, and uh, it's just a further progression into a, a digital economy that includes everyone. Thank you so much, Angela. Mr. Qualtro. Thanks, Thomas. You know, I, I kind of said it in my remarks, but for me, I think this is not only game changing for the individuals who will benefit from this technology, financial uh, independence, security. I loved Angela's use of the word dignity because that's really what it's about. Um, but it's also a signal to all Canadians and, and, and to our country that, you know, inclusion is the way the, the world has to move and, and we can't leave people behind and people can't continue to be an afterthought and we can't build things and then figure out later how to make sure everybody can benefit from them. We have to be inclusive from the start. And this is, this is addressing a long, you know, standing barrier um, to full inclusion. So um, I, I, I see this as such an important um, signal um, but practically, it's also a life hack that many of us are going to really benefit from quite significantly. Although I think when I change my pin and I don't give it to my daughter, she's going to be quite offended, but I, I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure she may be a bit upset, but it's really more about you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Minister. And John, how about you? Yeah, I, I don't know that I can add, and I think uh, Mr. Qualtro in her opening remarks talked about it. This is fundamentally about respect and equality. It is about financial security. It's about, you know, being able to do the things that for most Canadians they take for granted is simple participation in the household to run around the store and pick something up for their family. Um, and, uh, you know, every time I talk to Canadians right across the country about this issue, um, it, it, it's something that we, we experience every day because we interact with these terminals every day. Um, so I hope it's symbolic of what is a bigger step in the journey towards, um, towards thinking about things through the lens of inclusion. Uh, nobody went about trying to create barriers uh, in payment terminals in the past. There's no secret society trying to make life worse for Canadians who are blind. Um, but that doesn't mean that the result isn't the same. And, uh, and I do think that this is uh, going to be a game changer and hopefully the beginning of game changes in many, many other areas. This is Thomas. Well said, John. Thank you. Uh, I do think this project will have significant lasting impacts for, for the sight loss community. Uh, my next question now a bit more broadly for Cana all Canadians with disabilities. And what do you think the benefit will be for all, all of those uh, Canadians with the more available uh, payment terminals that are more accessible. 
Um, perhaps Minister, we'll start with you and then we'll move to John and then uh, Angela can finish up. Thanks, Thomas. So um, again, this is about inclusion for me. So this is about making it easier for everyone, regardless of your disability or not having a disability. If you're a senior, um, you know, John, it really struck me when John said this is something that's kind of in our face as a barrier every day. Everywhere you go, you go for lunch, you go to the mall, you go to McDonald's, you go to the pharmacy to get your prescriptions and literally, you know, multiple times a day, you're confronted with the fact that the world wasn't built for you. And this is changing that. And so this is sending a broader message, as I said earlier, to everyone with a disability that, um, that we are taking your needs into consideration, that we are deliberately building with you in mind. And that's empowering, that, that makes you feel good, that makes you feel part of something and less excluded from a lot of, of things that go on in your daily life. So it's a big deal. Definitely, definitely. John, do you want to follow up on that? So, so I, I, uh, I'm going to talk about the other, the other side of the person at the other end of the terminal. Um, you know, I think that this also opens up for, for all Canadians with disabilities and certainly for Canadians with sight loss. The idea that maybe they can be the retailer, they can be working in the retail environment, they can be a business owner that is participating in the economy that way because now there's an accessible way for them. To, to participate and, and see their dreams come true in whatever that may be. So uh, I think we've, we've spoken about the daily interaction of the terminal and, and yes, that's huge. Uh, but I think that there's a long tail that comes with this as well that's gonna benefit, uh, benefit even more people. Thank you, John. And Angela. Hi, it's Angela. I think what I'll add to this is that by Moneris, launching this solution with the CNIB and starting to make it a, a, a part of every single new terminal that we ship out to business, we are going to start to establish a new standard that businesses will expect to be part of the way they conduct their business going forward. So we are at the beginning of truly, as Minister Qualtro said, a game-changing event, and it is going to become the requirement for players like ourselves to make that available. And so uh, I'm thrilled that we are going to be there first and that we are going to be part of establishing a new standard of accessibility in Canada. Thank you, Angela. I, I think that's really impactful, a new standard of accessibility in such a, a field that really needs it. So thank you for that. We'll move on to our final question before we open it up to participants. And our final question is, how will we ensure that accessibility is at the forefront of payment terminal innovation going forward, especially as new ways of payment are being uh, offered so quickly. Why don't we start with John and then we'll move to Angela and then have Minister Qualtro close us out. So I, 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 I don't know why I get the most difficult one first. Um, uh, we don't know what the future is. And I do think that, that the, the one thing that we have not done uh, in society writ large, and by the way, this isn't a Canadian issue, this is a global issue, uh, is think about everyone at the beginning of, of the ideas. Think about full inclusion. Um, and it sounds like such a simple thing, but yet we, we seem to find it so hard to do, and, and, and I, I don't understand it. I, I, I know that for, for uh, uh, Angela, uh, Brown here, um, we first met and started talking about this journey, I'm going to think it was 18 months ago, it could have been two years, COVID has completely distorted my, my sense of uh, elapsed time. Um, but I, I think that once we establish that this is an expectation, uh, the baseline is that, that everything needs to be uh, inclusive, will there be net new things that raise barriers? I'm sure there will. Um, but uh, hopefully the vast majority of everything moving forward uh, as it relates to payments and transactions will be fully inclusive. Thank you, John. I, uh, I have that same hope as well. Um, Angela, why don't you go next? Happy to. 
It's Angela Brown from Monaris. And, uh, you know, although technology in some ways created some of these barriers, it's also going to be the path to solving them. And the exciting thing is at this point in time, the technology that we have in our core solution and the technologies for on screen uh, differentiation of font and background lighting and uh, audio and some of the things that wouldn't have been possible a few years ago are now possible. And so when we collaborate with people such as the CNIB and the Government of Canada, we can now leverage this technology and really make a difference. And ultimately, it's to satisfy our business customers who want to satisfy their consumer shopping customers. And so there'll be lots of competition and lots of energy to make it work. And you can count on us to really drive that. We are really looking forward to it. And uh, again, I do see technology being one of the things that's going to help all of us in the future to have a more accessible and inclusive economy. This is Thomas, thank you so much for that, Angela. And we're gonna hold Moneris to that, definitely. <laughs> All right, Minister Qualtro, why don't you close us out? Thanks, Thomas, it's Carla Qualtro here. Um, you know, I, I think the really important part of this discussion around the business case for inclusion is that this is gonna become an expectation both of consumers, but also of retailers, of, of citizens, the idea of this is that it's, you're not gonna be able to get away with not doing it. Um, and businesses are gonna see the advantage and the competitive edge that this gives them. Um, and this might open minds to how other assistive or adaptive technologies could also give them a further competitive advantage. So, you know, it, it, it was hard for me as a human rights lawyer to stop talking all the time about rights and, and access and equality and discrimination and really start talking the language of business about the business case for inclusion and in doing this. But those conversations have to both be had on an ongoing basis and really challenge um, our underlying assumptions. And to John's point, I said it earlier, we just, we got it, we hide very nicely in this country behind the duty to accommodate. And we take comfort in the fact that if we haven't figured things out now, eventually we will and we're gonna have to, um, but in the meantime, you're not included. And I think we need to say that that's not the way we treat our citizens anymore in this country. And with the Accessible Canada Act, we are putting down a marker that we have to include from the beginning and take responsibility for off of the individual for uh, accommodation and put it squarely on organizations and businesses to step up. This is Thomas, well said, Minister. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you to our, our panelists for that fireside chat. We'll open it now up to our, um, our participants here at Connecting the Dots and any media who may be on the call. However, media was asked to RSVP before, so we'll see if there's anyone. We have quite a number of questions in the uh, Q&A box. So why don't I read um, two or three of them out and then we can have our, our panelists answer those questions if that sounds good. All right, Michael asks, uh, for those who are interested, how can they participate in product testing for this project? Crystal says, thank you, Minister Qualtro and Angela for your work in this area, being champions. When is this being launched and when successful, what are the next steps to really mark this out to the community and push other vendors in this direction. And Brent also asked, when will this new POS be available for use in Canada? So why don't we open it up to the three of you to answer those questions. I would like to start first. Shall I? It's Angela. Okay. Perfect. Uh, uh, because I, I spent time with our team to understand where we are. There's been a significant amount of work already invested in understanding the issues related to the current point of sale, getting advice, expert advice from uh, CNIB on what would improve the, that interaction, and then an assessment technically of what is possible to make changes to. So there's been a full vetting of the solutions, both from a usability and an appropriateness, as well as the technical feasibility and now we are about to start building 
we have a full plan to test with the CNIB. So for those of you who would like to be a part of that, I think that that'll be something that uh, John could speak to. And uh, there will be some opportunities for sure. We will not launch it without proper vetting from the CNIB. John, do you want to? Yeah, add? well, I would just say that, you know, our, our job is to be kind of the custodian of the community voice here. It's not it's not the CNIB's voice. It, it is, uh, is people uh, from across the country who we will reach out to to ensure that we're getting perspectives from across the spectrum of sight loss. Um, I, I'd like to, to get pers perspectives from uh, communities across the country. Uh, and then the, the rollout of it is going to be um, is, is going to be the second phase. So the first phase is let's get something available, uh, you know, in the spring of next year. Uh, I know from the conversations I had with, with Angela starting a year and a half, two years ago, that the teams have, have been working on this. This has been in, in, in their, their thought process for some time. Um, uh, so it's not just beginning today. Today is a great opportunity to announce that we're confident now that there will be something in the spring next year. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Angela and John. Um, Max Crawford has his hand up. Perhaps we can unmute him so he can ask his question. Hi. Uh, hello there. Hello? Hello, Max. Oh, can you hear, can you hear you? me okay? Good. Yes. Please That's go ahead. Right. I've been having problems. Okay. I guess my biggest point that I have is I feel is there is there will there ever be a day where where there's a standard across Canada and banks and stores where a blind person or you know someone visually impaired can pay with their bank card because my point is my at the bank of Montreal that I went to the worker that I was talking to a year ago didn't really know how the machine worked I found I tried plugging in a pair of headphones and I couldn't figure it out there needs to be a standardization across all bank machines. And, and then another question I have is, will they ever put Bluetooth into the machines? Because you need to use you know, a pair of headphones, analog headphones, and I think they're gonna be harder to get as time goes by. I think th those are both great questions, Max, and, and, and you're right. It, the inaccessibility of the devices, uh, almost 50% of the problem is the inconsistency with layout and structure and the sequence of questions. You know, for those from the community that are, that are in the panel today, we know that kind of the, the routine and sequencing of things and the ability to learn how you, you basically hack your way through life and using today's term, um, it, you know, it is part and parcel of it. And when, when you've got to learn 50 different hacks for the 50 variations of terminals, it just becomes, you know, really challenging. Um, and and I, I saw Angela nodding. And, uh, you know, we know that that Bluetooth environment um, and how, how to do that in a secure way is, is definitely needs to be a part of the future. But I think Angela can probably comment better on on the technical part of your question, but but to your point, Max, you, well said, uh, and and like you, I, I expect that we'll be in a place where we don't have to think about those challenges. Uh, hopefully, in the not too distant future. That's it's Angela from Monaris, and yes, John, absolutely. Uh, we will continue to evolve the technology. And I do believe that convergence of the technology so that the experience is the same at all the points of sale is something that we're going to have to collaborate with the government of Canada on as well as the CNIB to make it a standard interaction that happens. And as you know, today there's on audio, that'll be a more challenging feature, but it's absolutely a doable feature that we will start to experiment with and we will continue to enhance. So I'd start with a, a, a audio jack solution first, and then with the goal to get to Bluetooth absolutely over time. And we're highly motivated to make these things happen. Each step of the way, when we make these enhancements, we have to test them for security. And I know you count on us to do that. And we will make sure that at all stages, we introduce solutions that continue to keep your funds and the business's uh, interactions secure. So uh, lots of work to do from a technical perspective, and we're on a very good path. This is... Uh, Thomas, oh, can I pop in? Um, Absolutely. 
Listen, one of the, the key functions of Accessible Standards Canada, which was CASDA before Max, is to do exactly what you're talking about. So the idea of creating some kind of standardized um, experience is exactly where we need this to go. I, I agree with Angela. We're going to have to, you know, major collaboration. This is not going to happen overnight. But even setting the goal of a standard is something that's never been done before. So, you know, it, it's not going to happen overnight, but even having Accessible Standards Canada out there advocating for common standards at a national level for anything in federal jurisdiction, which banks would be, is a real, again, it's, it's sending a message of inclusion and that it's not up to you to figure out those 50 different ways of paying. It's really up to us to to figure out the one way that can be there for everyone. This is Tom. Uh, thank you for, for all of that. I, I think there is definitely a lot of work to be done to ensure those standards are developed. And, and thankfully, we have a partner in the federal government who's, who's willing to, to make those standards happen in terms of accessibility. Uh, I am cognizant of time, perhaps at Minister Qualtro, it is 1130 and you do, the House of Commons is sitting today. Um, but perhaps for Angela and John, if you maybe have another five minutes, we do have maybe three or four other questions that need, that would uh, like to be answered. Can I just say a quick goodbye then, Thomas? I do have to go get back to the House, virtually to the House of Commons. Take care, Thank everyone. Thanks Thank for you having so me. Much. Thank you so much for being here, Minister. All right. Thank you, Minister. All right. We have Kim Kilpatrick, who has her hand up. Perhaps we can unmute her so she can answer her question. Yes, thank you so much for this. This is uh, way past time. I can't even begin to imagine the number of cobbled together solutions I do uh, to get this. My question is about um, not uh, having businesses not install inaccessible um, systems. So would there be something in the standards or in the policies that would say, no, you can't have your business uh, set up unless this is accessibly done because we know that people do duck out of things or use old systems um, yeah. way Kim, beyond Kim, their time. Hi, Kim, how you doing today? How's Ottawa? Um, it's been a while since we've chatted. Uh, it's John. Um, I, I think that once there is this accessible solution that is being rolled out and available, um, it will provide the ammunition for us to, to talk to to government about um, about the types of policies that would prevent someone from doing something net new which is inaccessible. You know, it's difficult to make that demand at, at a point in time when you don't have uh, a, a solution that uh, that is, is is as accessible as the solution that we believe will be being rolled out in in the spring. So, uh, but your point is is uh, so 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 key um, that we've got to be prepared to put some teeth behind it uh, once the, there is something accessible out there. Uh, yes, in the long term, it's going to be economically the best thing to do for businesses because you will select along with many other people across the country will select to go where it is more accessible. Their families will select. So economically long run that will help, but I do think we're gonna need some policy teeth as well um, once we have a product launched. Thank you, Kim. Nice to hear your voice. Thank you, Kim, for that question. We have a few more written questions um, and then I think it'll be time to wrap up. So I'll just, group some of them together, um, if that sounds all right. Jennifer asks, are you able to describe how the technology will work at this point? And Debbie asks, how will the terminal work? Could you provide some specifics? Will it interface with a smartphone? And then Carolyn asks, what retail locations will be getting machines from Oneris? Oh, on your on mute, just so you know. Angela, do you want to start first? Sure. It's Angela from Moneris, and uh, we are going to be starting by removing some of the barriers uh, that, w that clutter the screen and prevent individuals from being able to see or hear the messages that are on the screen. So we're going to streamline the on-screen messages and the brand branding so that it really focuses on the amount 
then the option to invert both the color, the background, and the font size, toggling up and down so appropriate for the individual uh, so that they can make that screen work. Then the audio portion will also be something we will be working with the CNIB on and with the hardware providers that we work with uh, so that we can enhance the audio capability of these points of sale. So it will, for partially sighted and blind, there will be a range of options and they should be suited to the individual and flexible to the individual. And so this is, this is where we're headed and this is what has been vetted thus far and that we will be testing in the spring. And once it's confirmed, it will become a standard part of all of the new terminals that we ship out to businesses. People do need to remember that many businesses hang on to old technology for a long time because they're comfortable with it and it'll take time for us to get them to uh, swap out old technology for new technology, but it will happen. And people are embracing tech, new technology at a faster pace than in the past. So I'm very optimistic for this becoming a very standard way of conducting business in, in, a, in a very short period of time. Yeah, and I, I just add to Angela, and I know that they've been working on a lot of really great enhancements. Um, just kind of the expectation, you know, this is going to be a leapfrog forward uh, in in the accessibility, um, but it will become more accessible in the second version as we have a much broader deployment and we learn from the community more. Yes, we'll do lots of testing, but testing has a limit. Um, so, you know, this is about an ongoing journey. Um, and and Moneris has hundreds of thousands of point of sale devices um, as part of its its market share, you know, the reason that we wanted to, that our initial discussions uh, between Andrew and myself were between our organizations. It's a great, proud Canadian um, organization. And we also wanted this to be a made in Canada solution as well. Thank you, Angela and John. This is Thomas. I do have one last question because I saw it and I thought, wow, this just fits in with everything that we've been discussing at Connecting the Dots the past two days. Samantha asks, is there um, anyone looking into the accessible POS system for low and blind employees and cashiers? Would it make sense to design them together with the accessible POS for a blind and low vision customer? So I, I made a comment about, I think that this hopefully is the beginning of the back end or the, the retail employee or uh, business person's side of the accessibility because you know that, that I think can be a game changer. You know, we, we talked about it being World Sight Day. This is National Disability Employment Month as well. And I know that's a lot of the focus around the connecting, uh, connecting the dots uh, um, sessions that we're having around Braille technology and employment. So, so I, I absolutely hope that that, that is uh, something that we will, get, uh, we will get to the back end side of it. I'm gonna do a shout out, just one thing and then pass it over to Angela. That, that there are other questions if we haven't got to them, because I believe Thomas is going to wrap up after Angela. Uh, we will make sure we get back to whoever's asked the question with an answer uh, and post them as well, just, just to make sure that we don't leave questions unanswered. Thank you. And it, it's Angela from Moneris. And I'll just add that one of the things we're very proud of with our core platform is that it is easier for the business, the retailer to use, as well as the consumer. And we have streamlined the messages and the instructions for the retailer and how to use that terminal. And so it's very in keeping with our goals and the way we've built our core technology that we will also make sure that the accessibility we build in for the shopper is also available for the employee or the, store, the shop owner. So we will absolutely make sure that that's part of our solution going forward. And thank you for that question. This is Thomas. That's all the time that we do have for today. Again, if you do have any other questions, you can always email them to advocacy at cnib.ca. That's advocacy at cnib.ca, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. I want to extend a big thank you to our panelists, Minister Faltro, Angela Brown, and John Rafferty, for joining us today in announcing the launch of such an exciting project that really will help all Canadians with disabilities make independent purchases. 
Thank you all uh, Connect the Dots panelists for joining us. Make sure to check out the Vendor Alley happening now until 4.30. And if you're interested, like I am, and you want to learn about how CNIB has been able to navigate the pandemic, please join us at 2.10 p.m. for session 701, where John Rafferty and other members of the executive leadership team will help to understand and explain how a 102-year-old charity took immediate measures to help minimize the impact of a global pandemic. Thank you all again. Have a rest of a great rest of your time at Connecting the Dots. Goodbye, everyone. my goals and that one of my goals being education and wanting to get my diploma. I now share my life and my journey of going through post-secondary as someone with vision loss on Alicia Grace Official to show others that it is possible to get an education despite any disability or anything. You can do it too. <laughs> Hi, my name is Curtis Ruddle and I am 15 years old and from Calgary, Alberta. I'm also a CNIB National Youth Council member. Did you know that blind and partially sighted people skateboard? We do. All we need is a few small adaptations to make the park easier for us to navigate. This is why I have been working on a fully grant funded community project called Alt Route. Alt Route is dedicated to providing a safe, accessible, and inclusive skate park environment for all of visually impaired youth. I am also a skier hockey player, brother, and student, and so much more. Oh, and I also happen to be visually impaired. Hello, I'm Ali Khalil, Program Lead of Innovation and Technology for Alberta, CNIB Foundation, and I provide um, training on all types of technology for clients. My journey with vision loss begins when I was seven. I lost about 80% of my vision in a span of a week. And from there, I kind of uh, mastered technology to accommodate my world. The phone and forward program is important to me because I really, really rely on technology. Technology really helped me um, accomplish my goals, you know, uh, complete my degree uh, in four years. For one of my first jobs that I had when I was uh, roughly 15 years old was uh, at Dollarama. Um, I was a merchandiser, but uh, one of the things is I, 
I disclosed my disability to my manager, but I had a phone and I knew how to accommodate myself. So, you know, I, I brought that to my my manager's attention and, and, and she, she said, yeah, you can use your device. So I used the magnifier uh, feature built into the iPhone. It took me a couple of days, but once I really got familiar with it, it evened out the playing field and I, I felt secure because I wasn't scared to lose my job because I knew I was doing it to the best of the, my ability and I had the right device that um, aligned with my skill set to do the job. Can you imagine how empowering it would be for me to find my way through an unfamiliar place? How empowering would it be for me not to depend on someone to safely take my medication? For me to walk to school without my parents, just like my friends. For me to be able to read a card from my daughter. <laughs> for me to do the simple things that may have seemed challenging before. With smartphones, these things and more are now possible. For some people, it's hard enough to make ends meet, let alone afford a smartphone. By donating your old smartphone, you could help to empower me and half a million other Canadians with sight loss. Here's how. Donate your used smartphone at phoneitforward.ca and we'll send you a tax receipt. We'll wipe your phone, refurbish it, and load it with accessibility apps that will help people who are blind. Then we'll give it to a Canadian with sight loss and give them one-on-one -on -one training on how to use it. Donate your old smartphone. Donate your old smartphone. Donate your old smartphone. Donate your old smartphone. Change the life of someone who's blind. Visit phoneitforward.ca, a program of the CNIB Foundation.